thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so, wow, where do you begin with retail? Um, let's 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 get to some basic things. You know, the last few years, the media um, and a lot of market watchers have gone with the story of the retail apocalypse. The reality is, yeah, retail was challenged already in a lot of categories, not all of them. Uh, some of those challenges were self-inflicted. E-commerce was a big one. I wouldn't say the only one, but I think that e-commerce really accelerated some issues already going on. Uh, the rise of the discounters, the big boxes that started in the 90s, uh, the reliance on debt, the impact of leveraged buyouts has been a monster. Uh, it's accounted for 60% of the bankruptcies since 2010. And, you know, the big problem is, is that a lot of these chains were so debt addled and it's hard to move a battleship on a dime. They knew shifting consumer tastes. Uh, they knew they needed to rethink their formats and so forth. But um, because they're debt issues, they had issues in, in being able to execute. And, and you know, I spoke, I, I can't name his chain, but the former CEO of a major department store chain I asked him, he was the CEO in the, the late 90s, and I asked him, did you see e-commerce coming? He goes, oh, hell yes, I did. At, at the time, people thought it was, at early stages, people thought it would be like a new catalog channel. And we saw it very early that it was going to be huge, that we needed to invest in it. Um, we also knew that for the previous eight years, we had been fighting a losing battle, trying to fight the discounters on their turf. We were reducing our expenditures on the store experience. We were trying to, to compete with a Walmart price point, a battle they couldn't win. Uh, and he was of the belief in the late 90s that this particular retailer should be closing stores that were still profitable, but uh, but selling that real estate when there was demand because they owned a good chunk of their stores, putting that investment into e-commerce and then focusing, uh, he was a mid range brand. He was like, our competition should have been Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Saks, not JC Penney, not Walmart. And I asked him, why didn't you do it? And he said, it was the nineties. It was a booming economy. We don't sell clothes. We sell stock. I would have been fired in an instant, frankly, if I suggested that strategy. Instead, the shareholders wanted them to open more stores because every time they opened a store, the stock price went up. So this is what dug a hole already. Now, the problem is, is that it wasn't the retail apocalypse before. We had some very hot categories coming up with some troubled ones and some and even within those troubled categories, there were winners and losers. The problem is now this is the retail apocalypse. Uh, with only one channel to go to for most small retailers, e-commerce, you've got a variety of players that were well positioned, like you know, William Sonoma, Nordstrom, et cetera. Uh, but the reality is, is that we have two, two crises going on. We have, we have the, the healthcare crisis, which creates a whole lot of questions about how do we reopen. But we also have the economic one, 36 million plus people laid off in the span of eight weeks, record unemployment. Uh, almost all of it started with service workers, but now it's setting off ripples to professional and business services. So the way I like to put it is the pandemic part of it doesn't make people afraid to shop. It makes people afraid of other people the economic part means we're afraid to shop. So even though all of this spending uh, that could be done on e-commerce, there's some players that could benefit in the traditional retail world. People are focusing on necessities for the most part. Maybe that'll start to balance out, but major department stores, you know, JCPenney is going to file today or tomorrow. Fact, it's going to happen today or tomorrow. Uh, we've already seen Neiman file. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of other troubled players and virtually every, re every retail chain, all the big guys, has had to take down their credit revolvers. And think of it in terms of your own credit. 
if you suddenly took cash advances and maxed out all the credit available to you, even if you just put it in the bank because you're expecting an emergency, your credit rating is going to plummet. Um, now, what we've seen is if you were A-level credit, if you think in terms of report cards, suddenly you're B. If you were B, now you're C. If you're C, now you're D. If you were D, now you're F. Now, D and below is generally what we'd consider the bankruptcy watch list. Coming into this year, looking at major retail chains, major restaurant chains, I had about 40 retailers on that list. It's now about 160, and that's just the publicly traded companies. Because they're on that list doesn't mean they won't get off that list. If they declare bankruptcy, it doesn't mean liquidation. Uh, L Brands is on that list with Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works. Bath and Body was killing it. If, if they didn't get a lifeline through lenders and so forth, someone would buy that for dimes on the dollar and kill it. Victoria's Secret, somebody would buy it, uh, probably use bankruptcy to shut at least half their stores and reconfigure it. But what, what COVID is, not just with people, it doesn't just prey on the vulnerable, it, it preys on every vulnerability. Uh, every vulnerability. And in retail, that's where the big challenges are, were, except where we had so many hot things happening. The problem is, is experiential retail, food and beverage, the explosion of it, uh, a whole lot of upstart digital native brands. If you go across the board with these, what we're dealing with is an awful lot of players that um, don't have deep pockets. And because of that, now we've got a whole bunch of things to worry about. Restaurants in particular, you know, people don't realize it, but Thomas Keller's financial model is no different than your mom and pop pizza shop. Going into this, uh, we did a poll of the restaurant users we work with, and we asked them, how long would you be able to survive uh, if a shutdown were to cut off your revenues effectively for one month, two months, three months, six months? And essentially what we got was that uh, – 30% of operators said they couldn't survive one month. If you get a 10% profit margin in restaurants, you're a rock star. The reason why restaurants are vulnerable today isn't because of lack of popularity with consumers. Since 2016, people have been spending more money eating out than eating at home. The vulnerability comes from the financial model. So when I look across the spectrum, Fine dining, it would be very conservative if we got out of it with 35% of the restaurants failing. Uh, QSR is fast food because 70% of their sales already came from uh, takeout, take home, drive through windows. They'll survive best, but their franchises, some of those big corporate models, you know, Subway, it's all mostly small business franchises. I expect 20% failures from that sector. If you look at casual dining and mid-range, that could include everything from Bloomin' Brands and uh, you know Outback Steakhouse and so forth and Olive Garden to your mom and pop pizza place to cool beer pubs that were killing it before. I expect that category somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% failures and then fast casual, which had been the hottest thing. The only big chains there are Noodles and Company and Chipotle. Chipotle is killing it. Noodles and Company was troubled already. They're going to file. The rest of it's independence. I expect 50% wipe out there. If you add it all up, we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000 businesses. It's a whole lot of space. And that's just with the basis my forecast was based on a two and a half to three month shutdown. Not on the idea that when you reopen, you're going to be at half occupancy or less, depending on your local situation, assuming consumers show up and feel comfortable in those sit-down models, which that's a big question for which we're really reliant on what happens with the pandemic, the uh, effectiveness of government response, not just in terms of controlling the pandemic, but also in terms of financial aid. A lot's been said about PPP funding, the small business loan program. Restaurants uh, and retailers together got about 20% of those funds on the initial wave. But here is the logistical issue on that, which is that almost all of the 
almost all of the restaurant businesses, whether you're Ruth's Chris or a mom and pop, technically qualify. Uh, and it's not that much different in retail. But when you get to the banks, guaranteed income, they could make small loans for a higher commission or big loans for a lower commission. If you're a banker and it's the same amount of paperwork either way, and your large clients come to you, you're going to, you're going to favor them first. Most of the little guys got little or nothing. And so far, anecdotally, that's what I'm hearing from the second wave of PPP funding. The, the reality is I don't have a problem with Ruth's Chris getting a loan. It's supposed to keep people employed, which would keep more econ economic dominoes from tumbling. The problem is it was nowhere near enough money. So we're in for some really challenging times because what was struggling in retail, the, the acceleration of its demise has been kicked up from five to seven years to five to seven months. And what was working basically has been put on hold. Uh, there will be immense rebuilding opportunities, but unless we get better at the way we're handling this, there's going to be such immense pain that, sadly, this is the retail apocalypse. Great. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, God, some of those numbers are staggering uh, and uh, seems to have gotten a little worse since we talked uh, just a little bit ago. Um, uh, with that, I'll come back with questions in just a little bit, but I want to pass it over to Sutrita um, to tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the e-commerce world. Sure. Thank you, Nico. Let me uh, share a few slides with everybody here. Hopefully you can see them. Um, I'm hoping that everybody can see them. One of the things that we have done at Forrester, and for those of you who don't know, I am with Forrester Research, which is a technology research company, and we do a lot of consumer surveys, retailer surveys, and surveys with companies and their responses, not just to technology, but very specifically in the last few weeks with respect to COVID. So this is a consumer survey that we fielded across five different countries asking people about their online shopping behavior. And not surprisingly, Surprisingly, this survey was conducted in mid-April, the percent of consumers who said that they were shopping more online than they had prior to the COVID crisis is a double-digit percent um, of people. And that, of course, is that China was a few months past their peak, and that number was the highest of everything here. China's a little bit of a different market, so we'll leave that aside. In the United States, we saw that figure at 41%. Now, I conducted the same survey in the month of March and the figure was about 15 or 16 percent. So even in just a few weeks, that number has gone up tremendously. And a large part of that, of course, is the number of shelter-in-place orders and um, just the, 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 the fact that consumers feel that they um, are at risk when they, when they walk outside. And that is certainly a driver of that behavior. Now, the question that everybody has, which is a very fair one, is how much of that is going to stick? And is this going to be the crisis for the rest of physical goods stores? And will we have to precipitate the closure of everything? And I think that a great way to frame it is, well, is this just a sugar high? Because remember, it was just a one month period of time where we went from people saying 15% of people saying that they were purchasing more online to 41%. And when you actually started to reopen the stores, you have screenshots like the one on the right-hand side where you'll have lines of people that are dozens deep waiting to get back into the physical stores. Or do you have what you have on the left-hand side, which is that the number of stores altogether is just going to shrink. And then when they close, that naturally becomes the, the catalyst for going back to online anyway, because you just don't have as many physical options to even stop. And I thought this was an interesting data point from Nordstrom because they announced, and it was a little bit under the radar, 16 of their full line stores. Well, that's a big deal because that's about 13% of the entire chain. And that is in a lot of secondary markets, markets like Richmond, Virginia, which if they don't have the option to go to the physical store to buy certain brands, of course, people are going to purchase those products online. Now, overall, you the um, uh, it's important to frame what, what what is the percent that we're talking about and what's the base case that we're looking at anyway. And at the end of 2019, Forrester's projection for the percent of total 
retail that was transacted online was about 17%. And then the phrase I like to use is 24 by 24. So in the year 2024, we had at least prior to COVID projected that 24% of all retail sales, and that's a composite of about 30 different retail categories would be transacted online. So that is, that's the base case to begin with. So e-commerce was definitely a factor that was affecting a lot of the retail landscape. And then we'll get into really what is the impact of COVID and does that catalyze sales. So the major, well, I wouldn't say a majority, but a significant portion of e-commerce, a third of that 17% from the previous slide comes from four categories. And that is four categories around the world. Uh, here are three e-commerce forecasts that we, we do, we probably have about 30 total around the world, but three of the biggest markets are China, the US, and the UK. Clothing is the single biggest category. Clothing was also probably the worst affected. Garrick certainly mentioned and talked a lot about that. And in fact, uh, many clothing retailers are not even seeing their e-commerce sites do well because people just aren't buying that particular category in any major way. Electronics is a unique category that has been large, continues to be large large, and it experienced a burst during the pandemic because people were buying office supplies, monitors, PCs, headphones. Those were a number of the physical goods items that were doing well. Household goods were also trending well in large part because people were sheltering. They were looking for the solutions that make their lives easier and made them more comfortable in their homes. And then food and drink has perhaps been the biggest story because you have so many more people purchasing online grocery and and purchasing their essentials than, than ever before, even though those are relatively small, at least in developed countries as a percent of total. China, we'll leave that aside because it's a, it's a unique case where they do not have a strong of a physical store infrastructure. So those numbers are not only larger, but their percent penetration is going to be higher. Now, the one place where I do think it's useful to look at China as an example, is what has that done? What did the pandemic do for penetration? And the reason that it's important to look at China is because they're a couple of months ahead of us. And we have some evidence from some of the grocers. This is from, this is a quote from the chairman of Walmart, which is one of the largest physical goods grocers in China. And their experience from January and February during the peak of their pandemic across the country was that what it did for the business in e-commerce is that it helped skip a year, perhaps a little bit more. So what are we translating that to? And that's that's what I think is an important piece is that our, this is not some scenario where we're going to get to 50% e-commerce penetration overnight. And when you also look at the fact that over, that, that there's, there's some pretty varied performance in how companies are doing, and the, a significant portion of retailers are not doing that well, even in their e-commerce business. I think that that is, is, really calls into question how much you have the penetration numbers growing overall. And this is data that I collected with a partner called Commerce Next. Um, this is all publicly available data, so you can go to their website if you're interested in finding out more. But we did this survey with retailers every few weeks through the beginning of the pandemic until the last week or so. And the last set of data points here on the right-hand side are the percent of retailers that were actually trending worse than planned. Now, the good news is that they were gra they've were they gradually been doing better, but you still have a significant portion that are doing worse. And a lot of those that are doing worse are those in those discretionary goods categories like jewelry or apparel. And what that translates to is the data that you see here, which is a revised projection post COVID for where we think that e-commerce will be. So where we had project, projected 2020 being at a 19% rate before the pandemic, it will leapfrog a couple of years. So we get to 21%. And then by 2024, you end up with a level that is slightly higher than where you would have ended without a pandemic, but not substantially greater than where you thought that it would be. And why is that? Why isn't it bigger? Why aren't we going to see 80% of our sales in e-commerce? And it has, um, a, there are a few different reasons why. First is that experiences overall have been pretty subpar. That has 
everything to do with the fact that if you've noticed your packages taking two weeks to arrive, that you have substitutions in your grocery orders, that you are getting orders canceled, that's part of the challenge with the experiences. And a lot of that has to do with inventory management systems that I'm not going to get into right now, but the experience just simply hasn't been subpar. And people are shopping online because they have to, not because they want to or because it's a particularly desirable or great experience. The second point is that consumers are not single channel shoppers. And what I mean by that is 95% of people do not shop in one channel only. They're, they're splitting some of their transactions online. They're splitting, they may start online and choose to complete their trans and off, transaction offline or vice versa. Only 5% of people only shop online every single time. And that's important to keep in mind. In the case of a category like grocery, it's even worse because there are so many grocery stores and it's so easy and it is often cheaper to go to a grocery store and faster anyway. So that's a category where we will, for the foreseeable future, have differences in channels continue to be part of the landscape. And then the last bit, which I think is probably the most important driver here, is that grocery in particular, which has through this pandemic been the category where that 41% of people are purchasing more, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a category that I'm not completely convinced that grocers are even going to continue to invest in it in the future because there hasn't been some massive transformational change to make it cheaper. It's extremely expensive for grocers to fill online orders. It's $7 on average for them to fill a click and collect order. It's $20 for them to fill an, a delivery order. And um, at the same time, consumers don't want to pay that. And grocers have a hard time meeting that margin because even on a $100 transaction, they may be making 2 or $3 in profit. So where does that $7 come from? Well, it's either you're going to have to pay for it or they're going to have to find advertisers to compensate for it. So what does that mean? Um, we know that stores are eager to do what they can to retain sales. You're seeing companies like Best Buy scheduling orders. You're seeing companies like Barnes & Noble and Dick's doing curbside contactless pickup to try to salvage as much as they can from a from a uh, physical store standpoint and to retain sales. But the consequences overall though are nonetheless clear because remember, we're still talking about a fifth of orders now, fifth of retail now going through the e-commerce channel and we're still overstored in the United States. And that means that because this pandemic will force so many more companies into distress, you will have more empty storefronts, you will see more malls um, having shakeouts at both the large and the small stores, particularly some of those large anchor tenants in malls. You're going to have more congestion in dense, dense urban areas in particular because of delivery vehicles. And that's also going to mean because of e-commerce and because there are fewer stores to fill from, what we call micro fulfillment centers. What are MFCs, micro fulfillment centers? They're essentially um, warehouses that are smaller, but they're located closer to urban areas so that you can fill things faster. And Nordstrom has invested in some of these MFCs in uh, regions like Southern California. There's a company called GoPuff you may have heard of that essentially has um, these micro fulfillment centers, particularly in university towns um, and and uh, essentially any grocer that decides to put one of these um, area, these fulfillment capabilities in the back of their grocery store would be considered an MFC2. Shop and Stop, for instance, is an example. Um, other examples of MFCs in the restaurant sector are things like ghost kitchens or cloud kitchens where you may rent a space and you are basically renting out um, a, a sink area and a fridge and a stove top to like 15 different restaurants in one area so that they can cook their orders and the Uber drivers can come to one place, pick them all up and take them you know, to people's neighborhoods as needed. And we know that that is uh, certainly also an area that will likely drive some of the congestion that we'll see through e-commerce because there are many people who the course of this pandemic are either ordering from restaurants online for the first time or more frequently than they were before. So what do planners need to do? First and foremost, prepare for a digital world. And what that means is something that I talk about often and talked about even when, um, when I shared my thoughts with the Urbanism Next um, audience before, 
which is to consider congestion taxes. We already see cities like New York and London doing that, but dense urban areas um, anywhere in the country really need to consider the same, especially during peak hours. You need to think about establishing clustered pickup and drop off points so that you aren't driving, you know, 50 different cars from 50 different restaurants or 50 different pickup points to 50 different addresses. Let people aggregate that those uh, those deliveries and make it on their own time often when they are on the way somewhere educate shoppers on the environmental impact of delivery um, we know that people are fine with pickup points which is what this data here showcases and we also know that there is a huge disconnect between the fact that young people value environmentalism but yet they don't realize that it has a huge impact on things like next day we want to invest in redevelopment of empty storefronts and things like ghost kitchens could be a solution to that. Um, you want to do things like create limits around how the delivery vehicles can operate. We talked in the earlier session about things like designated slots and really regulating where delivery vehicles can, can actually be parked in order to uh, deliver what they need. And the last bit is also in all communities to support efforts that support stores. And what I mean by that is that you know we have to get beyond this discussion of the only thing that will solve the pandemic being to wear masks and have hand sanitation solutions in front of your building. It needs to be engineering solutions as well. It's everything from state of the art filtration systems to state of the art, um, you, you know, kind of disinfectant solutions. Companies like Emist are part of that. Far UV lights in every public space and partnering with public health departments in order to get the subsidies to put these in these. Um, environments so that people are comfortable actually going into public spaces. And then the last little bit that I want to talk about is that higher postal delivery rates is something that's on the table right now. And that is one of the few things that will actually force people to consider how the, the all of the externalities, the negative externalities that are coming with e-commerce now. And right now you have Amazon fighting against it and also a whole bunch of retailers that are fighting it for unclear reasons, because they have stores they need to make sure that stay alive. And the best thing that retailers should actually be doing is to actually be pushing for those higher delivery rates so that people actually have a reason to go back to physical stores. So um, that's just another thing that I would actually, as, an, or as a city, encourage, because that, that's something that actually makes people actually experience the, the true cost of, uh, of, a, of an, of an e-commerce delivery. So, okay. So I'll, I'll shut up now, Nico. <laughs> great. Uh, that was great. Uh, both, uh, Garrick and Citrita, uh, perfect. Uh, oh my goodness. I've got a whole series of questions and there's a lot of them coming in as well. It's, it's, at the same time, I'll try to, uh, balance both these things. So one of the first questions, um, Citrita for you. So you, uh, said that one of the things that you think are limiting the, the, the kind of explosion of e-commerce, uh, we're seeing a big growth, but you don't think it's going to stick in part because of the subpar experience and in part because of the costs. And part of the question is, um, do you think that some of that, especially if we end up having, you know, so again, I go back to if it ends tomorrow, you know, miraculously, like we're able to all go back. Uh, we look at these, the, the performance, some of these things, and we go back to some of the trends that we had before. But if this continues on for six months, 12 months, uh, companies have a chance to keep figure out the kinks uh, on the on these issues and there starts to be a uh, economies of scale that make maybe some of the delivery uh, less expensive and my brother works in in the in the grocery world uh, the, the the kind of a delivery uh, commerce side um and you know the economies of scale are a big limitation for this so do you think that it's possible that uh, the more time that we're in this that there might actually be a uh, the the business model might get figured out right the the, the might get figured out and and the economics might get figured out and that they would be actually making it um, uh, more enticing? Well, for the economics to work out, there really needs to be a pretty massive change. You'd need to have more of those micro fulfillment centers. There's a company called Takeoff. There's some of these robotic solutions that basically um, can cloister a part of the store to the side. They can pick like 100 orders all at once. You don't have to deal with a lot of the substitution issues because you basically marked off inventory that's just for e-commerce orders. So if you can get there, sure, absolutely. But the cost of 
of executing that is like a million dollars or more and per location. And you're probably going to need like a hundred of them. So how many grocers in a down economy are going to be able to do that? That's the great, you know, I mean, maybe they will choose to invest in there and, and may, you know, and certainly Walmart is already making that investment and they'll likely continue to see more in that direction. But whether or not every other grocer does, I mean, their margins have actually declined because they've had to increase their sanitation um, procedures. They've had to pay their store associates more to even show up at work. So I don't know that they yet have the appetite or the willingness to invest that level that they need to. They may do it in a handful of markets like Seattle, San Francisco, the New York area, the Northeast, but it probably isn't going to be everywhere. The other piece is that, you know, this is why I talked about like the UV lights and the e-mist solutions. It's like there may be another way for us to get out of this pandemic. Everyone talks about the only thing that is going to change behavior is vaccines or herd immunity. And my question is, our goal is to reduce the R naught. We just need to reduce the number of, con you know, kind of infections that any enclosed environment creates. Right now, the only thing we're talking about is the masks and the hand sanitizer. There are other things that can be the patchwork solution when people don't wear masks that can still keep you safer in physical environments, like the electrostatic mist sprayers and the UV lights and, you know, kind of the, the HEPA filters, the really, you know, kind of high quality HEPA filters. And that's nobody's talking about that stuff. And, you know, kind of if you put all of those together and you have social distancing and you have the masks, can we make people feel comfortable in physical spaces? And my argument would be that, you know, we, we won't know until we try, but we certainly haven't tried yet. So Garrick, I'm seeing you nod a whole lot as, as Citri is saying this. Do you, do you think I, this is like so one of the main things that, that cities should be focusing on and how to uh, kind of assist with these other ways of making uh, um, us being in these we'll call them public spaces, right? Our, well, our... You know, one of, one of our great big challenges is at the public level, we're not, we're not good at complex situations. And we like black and white binary choices. And unfortunately, the, the public debate had become one that was death by disease or death by financial deprivation as opposed to what it really should be, which is effective crisis management and mitigation versus both. Because if people are terrified, they're not gonna show up. And, and I get it, there's a lot of people that are showing up in the places that have reopened. What keeps me up at night is that yes, the overall death tolls are down in the US. Take New York, take Detroit, take New Orleans out of those numbers, they're going up. You know, pandemics follow the, the patterns of travel. So it's only natural that the global gateway dense cities are hit hardest and there's massive geographic difference. Uh, small towns in rural America was gonna feel it last and, and the lack of density helps them, but it doesn't mean they're not gonna feel it. And, and that's, that's what keeps me up at night. Uh, as far as cities, I. I think you can you can obviously see that what's what's happened is is that the government's gone with kind of a federalist argument, leave the states and municipalities on their own. Uh, that could be debated a million different ways, but I would say if, if you're a municipal government, don't count on too much from the Fed, and figure out your own plan. But there's all these little effective effective measures that could really help mitigate, so we could we could find a way in the next twelve maybe up to 24 months that we could survive with, with minimal, well, well, with mitigated economic impact and mitigated uh, loss of life. And, and we're, we're not there. We're not, we're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask a question. Uh, Carrick, you mentioned in, in uh, the comments you had, it, it was really striking to me, this idea, I mean, first of all, the numbers are just staggering, right? 30, 35, 50% of the businesses going out, uh, going, going away. Um, and first question about that is the, something you, you kind of talked about, but not directly was the, there's an issue here between that these, many of these businesses are small businesses, right? So, uh, the, the, the things that we see mostly in our retail environments are small business, even when they're chains, they're like locally kind of owned and, and they don't have the, the, the bandwidth for these things. Uh, on the other side, the shoot right? Like e-commerce, these are mostly large businesses. 
So is there is part of the shift that we're going to be seeing just uh, uh, going to be a remnant of uh, like the the nimbleness or the or the, um, the 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 bank role that they have, right? Which would be less like of you know they are the right uh, delivery model, right, for how we buy a thing, but more like the economics of you know like the huge companies versus small companies. Garrick, maybe we'll start with you. In in, in retail. No, and obviously there's some categories. I mean, grocery, drug stores, convenience stores, dollar stores, off price apparel, even though they don't usually bother with, with e-commerce because of the price point, uh, that are all going to be, all their balance sheets are generally good, unless they had troubles before. Those are going to be fine. There's going to be some categories like automotive, uh, aftermarket parts that recessionary pressures always help those guys. Uh, but yes, it, 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 the, the challenge is that so many of the, the positive stories in retail were driven by small business. And um, they will be driven again, but they don't have the deep pockets. And, and I think that, you know, I, I've, I've always wondered, and I'm wondering, uh, Sucharita, what your thoughts are. I've, I've always thought of it like, you know, are we going to have just a duopoly or triumvirate of Target, Walmart, Amazon? Uh, because I don't even know how you get into uh, the e-commerce game as a new retailer and just not use their marketplaces as opposed to creating your own infrastructure. It's so expensive. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I think that it's going it, to, you know, what ultimately happens is going to be different for different categories. What we're starting to see in the commoditized, say, the packaged goods space is a lot of brands starting to sell directly to consumers. You may have seen at Frito-Lay, as an example, this week, finally started to sell its chips directly to consumers. I think that there are a lot of issues and problems with the way that they, they chose to execute it. But the idea is a good one. And that's likely something that we'll see a a lot more of. It's sort of like the Nikeification, Nike being one of the predecessors and really one of the, the leaders in selling direct to consumer and really pushing that as a channel and trying to stay independent from the, these marketplaces that you're absolutely right are just eating everything else up. And I do think that if you are a new fashion brand, because they're, they're you know, when these department stores go out of business or some of these chains go out of business like a J. Crew. Um, they are not out of business yet, by the way. But so, you know, I maybe I don't want to jump the gun there. But um, if and when they do go out of business, what, that's going to mean that there's an opportunity for somebody. But what, how do they how do they gain a voice? And you know, some of it, some of the most clever ones have been using things like Instagram or Pinterest or some of the social networks like TikTok to gain a, a share and awareness and try to maintain their independence from the Amazons of the world. Um, the restaurant industry is going to be a fascinating one because the stores, uh, the storefronts will absolutely disappear, but the talent of the chefs will not go anywhere and they will continue to be there. The question is, well, what's the format that it takes? And, you know, do they become Become food trucks in the interim, or do they, you know, is it going to take 10 years for them to reopen a storefront because this last one had to declare bankruptcy and then they had to wait for years before they could open up another storefront, um, you know, or do they get renegotiated, you know, terms? I think almost across the board, that's, I mean, Garrick, that's probably something that, that you know, you guys are talking about constantly is, you know, who's the biggest loser in all of this and and it's hard not to get go back to you know a lot of the property owners you know ultimately who who has to bear the the brunt is is you know kind of it you know comes back to people not being able to pay their rent and if they can't pay their rent it's either has to be renegotiated or or they're the ones that 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 you know kind of have the empty storefronts right I'd, I'd love to hear. I mean, it seems like the, the real estate impacts on this uh, are tremendous. So I'd love, love to hear your thoughts on that, Garrick. Well, well so this is, this, is, this is the worst crisis that we've ever seen in retail, period. It's the only one I've ever seen where across the board, tenants, landlords, lenders, suppliers, government are in the same boat. And uh, if, to get through this mitigate the most damage, it would require everyone working together creatively. And I'm not so sure that that 
is going to happen outside of a few innovators. I mean, here, here's the challenge, you know, if you're in a restaurant industry and, and you're a sit down model, if you're fine dining 5% or less of your sales before came from delivery services, from uh, takeout, uh, it's, it's about 50% for fast casual. It's about 20% uh, for your uh, casual dining chains like Chili's and so forth. If you do pivot to delivery, even though a lot of the delivery services have been really working actively, particularly with independents to lower fees or defer fees, the typical fees were anywhere from 15 to 30%. Now there's an amazing advertising function that they serve that a lot of restaurants said, well, we don't really make any money on the delivery, but we reach a new audience that then comes in to our dining room. Even with mitigated fees, players just don't make a lot of money on that. So, you know, the, the challenge is, is if you go to a landlord and you say, I need two months of rent abatement, forgiveness, blend and extends, a lot of more progressive landlords are doing it. But as we reopen, if suddenly the demand is, can you give me a year of half rent? It's going to get harder and harder. And, and so that's why we really need we really need governments to get involved. We really need lenders, you know, to work cooperatively. And that's really hard. That's hurting cats. I mean, we've already seen a few people take hard lines, um, but some, sometimes it's bargaining position. Sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's not. So, so you're, you're, you're painting a fairly grim picture here. If I was a city thinking about what's going on and uh, what, what my storefronts look like, uh, everything from my strip malls to, you know, like my town centers. Um, well, so I, I would say, I would say outdoor centers, the outdoor strips are in a whole different situation because first anchors were necessity retail. Uh, if you look at who paid rent in April, mall landlords got somewhere between 20 and 30% of their rent. Outdoor strip, power centers, neighborhood, community, they got between 70 and 80% of the Wow. For those guys, their challenge is going to be about the small inline users that were independent businesses going under, not their anchors. Interesting. So, so um, all right, this brings two other questions. So, first question. So, as cities are facing this, what kinds of things should they be doing? You know, Sutrita talked about things that they can be doing in terms of... Uh, of uh, kind of trying to make safer environments, helping to, to, to have, have that happen across. But a city looking at, oh my goodness, you know, 30% of my retail is gonna go away. How should they be preparing for this? What, the, and I'm wondering from the policy side, from the, you know, the, the urban design side, from the, uh, the real estate side, how should they be thinking about this? How can they, what can they best do to, to, um, to help, you know, businesses through all this? Well, I, I can I can jump in. I, I I think that there is this is so potentially catastrophic for so many you know so many communities that they they do need to try to do what they can from a changing laws and lobbying for for some of these differences um, that that would that would help to preserve the physical stores. So some of it could be as basic as you know, like no, like the retailers did not have a lobby in Washington D.C. Um, that really helped them get any part of this of the CARES Act. They were pretty much left high and dry, and they were in some cases explicitly excluded from getting any aid. And I, you know, kind of, because the retail lobby doesn't really have anything there. It's it's important for towns and communities to help where possible or to ally with the Chamber of Commerce so that the Chamber of Commerce, you, you know, kind of makes sure that these people um, are explicitly accounted for beyond just PPP, because I think that's what is important to keep in mind is it's more than just PPP. And part of the issue with PPP is this whole 25% limit on what can be used for utilities and rent when the unemployment 
unemployment insurance benefits are so attractive that they can't get their people back anyway. So, you know, can there be some forgiveness for these retail storefronts, you know, with some of these PPP guidelines? So that's that's one thing. Um, there is the congestion taxes. There's the taxation. There is the disincentivization of e-commerce to try to push as much as possible back to physical stores. And there is no reason why you wouldn't want to push things back to the physical store. If for no other reason, it can help communities connect with one another, especially because a lot of these neighborhood centers have, you know, a lot of events and activities that are for the benefit of a community. So why, why not actually put those congestion tax taxes in action, specifically around, you know, kind of um, those really, really busy time frames? Um, cities absolutely should be looking at things like this, um, these postal rate hikes and, uh, and, you know, kind of be, be fine with them. I don't, I don't know what is, why that's something that, you know, there's such a huge lobby that is anti, um, you know, kind of higher postal rates, but when the postal service is, is, you know, kind of on the verge of bankruptcy, why aren't we doing what we can as a society to help them? And it should be more than just the federal government that bails them out. I mean, they should have the ability to have greater inflation in, in their product mix. So, so I think that those are, there, there are a number of things that, that, that cities can do. And I think it's absolutely fine to be engaging in and advocating for the actions that explicitly support stores, even if it's at the expense of e-commerce. Let me ask you, um, blending a couple different questions that we're getting uh, uh, online from the audience. One is, uh, how do you see this uh, differentiating geographically? And uh, I'm going to talk about geographic a couple different ways. So different part regions of the country, uh, uh, first of all, and also related to that, um, uh, how that how that places that are opening up right now versus not opening up or opening up slowly, how that might change what we're seeing, right? So uh, does opening up slowly help? Uh, and, and how might that affect? And then finally, um, the kind of the is are you seeing differences in the things you're looking at in urban, suburban, and rural? Yeah, well, well, you know, right out of the gate, all of this goes back to consumer mentality, right? Which which is shaped first and foremost by your own personal experiences. Then there's all these other factors: your income level, your age, your race, your geography. In this case, your healthcare status, uh, the healthcare status of the people that you live with, uh, and then certainly your belief systems, whether it's religious, political, ideological, philosophical, et cetera. So, you know, so far we see a complete difference of people in, say, New York City Metro, which has just been clobbered, than, say, what we see in the, the suburbs of Houston. Uh, in a way, I hope it stays that way because it'll mean that we've mitigated the spread. You know, right now, 9% of Americans know someone who's died, which I think probably explains why so many people are viewing it as this great big civil liberties affront to wear a mask. That'll change when we get to 20%. How many people have to die till we get there though? And that's the bummer because COVID and the issue of vulnerabilities, it's exposed our extreme vulnerability when it comes uh, to us as a society. And just being able to build simple consensus is, you know, around real basic measures that would be helpful to all of us. Um, I, I think you're gonna see uneven results all over the place. The challenge for the big retail chains though, is that most of their best, no one comes to us and say, says, Find us a space with the least amount of density and the least amount of foot traffic, right? So most of their big producing stores, most of the big chains uh, footprint is in denser urban or denser suburban areas. And uh, you know, they're rural retail, that's dollar stores nowadays. Dollar stores are going to kill it, not only just because they could stay open throughout this as an essential retailer, but the, the focus on value on the backside of this, I think you'll see the same rates of growth with dollar stores for the next few years, because the last few years, since 2010, it's about $12,000 stores have opened up in the US. So I think we're just gonna have this, and luxury will come back eventually, although it might be uh, 
it might be two or three major brands own all the banners because luxury retail outside of a couple of big players tend to be very debt heavy and cash poor. And the luxury re uh, consumer always eventually comes back. After 2008, they were back in a year. But I think there's gonna be a big gap in the middle. And I think geographically, uh, it's gonna be a little bit different here and there, but you know, if Macy's is okay right now, but the, if they really get hammered on their volumes for four or five, six months, they might not be. And if they go down, they'll probably go down just about everywhere. So that's, that's the real challenge for the big chains. Sutri, mm -hmm. what are you seeing in terms of like difference in geographically, uh, both different parts of the country and the urban, suburban, rural? It's still a little too early to tell because of the, of the regions that have already loosened their restrictions and they've allowed malls to reopen or they've allowed businesses to re-engage, we're still seeing relatively little uptake. If you were to take a list of the stores in a mall that are actually open, it's like maybe 30% of all of the stores. And a lot of it is not even the big stores that are, you know, it's not like the Apple stores are open and, and I don't think they're open anywhere yet. So, um, it, so, so you still have this reticence on the part of businesses to re-engage. And part of it could be they're, they're afraid for their employees. It could be that their employees don't want to show up for work. So you, you still, um, we're, not, we're not at the point yet where we've turned all the dials on. And you, because of that, we don't know how the customer is going to respond and react because they don't have full choice. The, the, you know, the choices that they had in January are not there yet. They have this like, you know, kind of partial set of opportunities. And of course they're not going, you're not going to see an economy reigniting when, you know, the options that you have available to you aren't even, you know, on par. But what, what I think is, is the big question is, you know, kind of this debate around even when we do reopen, is it going to be this V-shaped recovery or is it going to be this like slow reignition? And I think given the fact that, you know, we've had such large unemployment, although admittedly a lot of that was incented unemployment, um, you know, or people incented to, you know, kind of take some of the generous unemployment benefits from the government and those run out at the end of June. Um, that's really the point at which we'll see how many of those people re-engage because they're forced to back into the economy. And when that happens, then I think you will have, um, you, you know, kind of a little bit more of a better read on on what's what's really hap what really is the potential here you still have so many people who it's it's their torn like you know 60 percent of people will say that they want they're worried about the economy they want the economy to reopen but then you know those are also the people that are terrified of going outside and you know they're they, they don't want to leave their house so so you, you you know kind of we have to make people feel comfortable and we have to we have to provide them jobs and we have to make them comfortable in their jobs and and we're not there yet and you know cuz i go back to you know the playbook is is you know masks sanitation you know hand sanitizer and testing that we don't have and you know kind of if that's if that's the playbook that's not going to get us to where we need to go and mm -hmm. we, need, we need some other solutions here. Um, let me ask, uh, uh, there's a couple different questions that are coming online uh, asking about uh, modes of delivery. And you know, is this a time when uh, we can be seeing, or how do we help uh, shift to modes? You know, the, the cargo bike type uh, things is something that seems to be coming up a lot. Uh, does it seem possible, feasible? How do, how do you do that? And maybe I'll start with you, Sutrita. Certainly any and all alternative forms of delivery. I mean, especially if the, the, you know, in a dense urban area, if congestion is an issue, a cargo bike was always uh, an option B there, you know, they're, they're more, um, 
you know, they, they, they don't take up as much space. Uh, you, they, can, they can carry heavy loads. There's a lot of advantage, advantages to like, e, you know, e-bikes and, and car, you know, kind of heavy, um, you know, kind of e-trikes. So absolutely, that, you know, that's, that's an option for some of these large delivery carriers. And I expect that in the future we'll, we'll get there. Um, you know, it's a matter of the, the carrier networks engaging in that, the, you know, the Ubers and the Lyfts, if they get into this type of package delivery, for them to invest in it too, um, that's certainly a, a solution as well for getting packages to, to people. Mm -hmm. Derek, are you seeing any of that is it in, the, in the work you're doing? Uh, you know what? Not so, not so much. I mean, really, again, I think Sushirita is the, the expert on, on that. You know, okay. honestly, mostly what, what we're dealing with are the brick and mortar retailers who have done this massive pivot to, to Bopus. And the restaurant guys struggling with how, how do we survive if our delivery channel isn't even profitable? And mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing some retail or some restaurant chains. And in fact, I would, I would be shocked if you did not see some of the giant QSRs creating their own delivery fleets down the road. And uh, in fact, I'm actually surprised McDonald's hasn't done it already. Uh, but the challenge really for, for a, lot of the, a lot of the folks out there is, you know, they, they can't just suddenly create their own delivery capabilities if they're bound up in a contract to a third party uh, provider. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, their hands are tied and, and, and pivoting to even like take out windows and stuff like that. We just haven't seen a lot of players who have just said, all right, look, let's look at the, the architecture of our building. You know, I, I, I was out last Saturday and there's a row in our suburbs of a whole bunch of fast food restaurants where the drive through lines were going out to the main street blocking traffic. There's an empty Denny's across the street. And the way the building was configured, I thought, you know what, A, you could easily cut a hole in the window where I can tell where your kitchen is and set up drive through. I would assume city leaders in this circumstance might back away from what really in the last few years in a lot of places has been a very anti-drive-through stance. Um, but I'm not seeing people do it. And so that's, that's a big challenge. I think, I think a lot of people have in their mindset, if we can just get through the lockdowns, but they weren't looking at what, what is going to be the pandemic norm? What if this is with us for two years? Because creating a vaccine and getting it, getting it tested and then getting it widely available I don't see that happening in anything less than 18 months. Well, and, and Karika, your comments just now remind me of, uh, I remember reading some things of, as Texas was reopening, uh, a restaurant owner there was saying like, who cares? Like if I can reopen, but at 50% capacity, that is no better than me not being open. Yeah. Are, are you seeing those types of things as well? Yeah, and of course the PPP thing, you know, uh, that, that whole issue of the 25%, for a lot of for a lot of restaurants was a challenge because they knew that even if they could reopen and, and they had to bring back 80 percent of their staff that their staff would be sitting around with nothing to do and mm -hmm. um, so there are some some restaurateurs who just passed on it mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. look ppp meant something payroll protection program it wasn't a bailout to the restaurants it was supposed to be a bailout to the employees the restaurants didn't really get much of a bailout mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, getting to the last questions here, uh, here's, here's a question. So of all the variables that we see in play right now, what is, the, what is the thing that you thought you wish you knew, you had a little bit of a crystal ball. So uh, what, what, what thing do you think is the most kind of important thing that we should be keeping on our, our eye on in the coming months and why? Uh, we'll start with Sutrita. Oh, I was hoping that you would go with Garrick first. Okay, well, we can start with Garrick. Garrick, are you ready, Garrick? <laughs> right, well, besides the obvious, the, the, the pandemic itself, if, you know, which, do we get lucky? Is there a break over the summer? Is it, you know, temperature sensitive? Uh, do we get our act together by the fall? Uh, do we get better about finding ways to come together and mitigate damage creatively? Or do we just dissolve into tribal uh, differences? What I would really like to see is, for me, the question of all the bankruptcies coming up is, are we in a unique situation where lenders and suppliers could be facing such an overwhelming amount of challenges 
that workouts may actually be more possible or not. Uh, what I suspect is going to happen is the triage system. I think a lot of retailers that were thought of as promising and just mostly impacted by COVID might make it through reorganization. And I think that some retailers that were thought of as dinosaur categories aren't going to get a ventilator. Grim <laughs> uh, analogies. Thank you. <laughs> Suchirita? Well, I, I think that if we will look forward, look, what, what do I, I think is going to be the single most important factor to, to know or to keep an eye on? I think that it really is, um, you know, kind of to, we have to look very, very carefully at these different states that are reopening and understand what is is happening and how that impacts and both the local economy, but also the spread of the virus. The great thing actually about the U.S. is that we essentially are running 50 different experiments, probably even more than that because every municipality is different at the yeah. same time. And we are seeing very, very different results. And there, you know, kind of it's important to look at a state like California and to look at a state like Texas, which have very different approaches and to still see that their death rate is roughly about the same. Is it going to continue to be about the same or is there going to be a massive divergence? Because that will, that gives us a lot of good evidence for what we could potentially do for the rest of the economy, not just opening stores, but opening schools, opening offices, resuming travel, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I go back to the, the instance with the guy for, on the JetBlue flight who was positive, but you know, remember this incident back in March and he mm -hmm. told people after he got off the plane, oh, by the way, I was positive. <laughs> Why was that not, to me, as crazy as it is, that should have been one of the most studied events. Why was, was that, a, did that end up being a super spreader event? And if it was not a super spreader event, why not? Why not? Because all of the details of that can tell us a lot about what needs to happen. Everybody also, by the way, Johns Hopkins right now has a, a six hour contact tracing class that they have given for free to everybody. Everyone on this call should take it. It is so easy and it will tell you a lot about the contact spreading process. And by the way, it's good for society because if your community may need a contact tracer, you could be in a good position to help. But that's the kind of thing that I think will, will, will help us get through and get to back to some semblance of normalcy, which is I think what we all want. Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, thank you to both of you. That was a fantastic session. Uh, God, even though the, the news is somewhat grim, uh, I, I love uh, one hearing, like knowing what, what's happening, but to also the, the points you all made and what cities could be doing to uh, kind of help through this process and just having a sense of what the future brings is, is, can help so much in, in us making uh, right choices.